If you don't know the Lord as your Savior this morning, you're the one. And the Lord wants to save you and uh, desires to save you and uh, is working even now by His Spirit in your heart, drawing you to Himself. That's what the Bible said. If the Son of Man be lifted up, He'll draw all men unto Himself. That was talking about His death, but I believe that's true in every uh, church service that is biblical, every uh, opportunity of witness that if we will lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, He's still drawing men, drawing men to Himself. Luke chapter 2, if you found your place there, this may well be one of the most familiar and beloved portions of the gospel according to Luke. And to this gospel record here, uh, we read it like I've done ever since before I can remember every Christmas, and uh, we've read it. In our home, how many have grown up reading this passage on Christmas Day with your family? Yeah, I think many of you have. How many memorized this passage at some, portion, at some point in your life? Yeah, many of us. And um, the story is old, but it's ever new, isn't it? It's ever new because of what God has done in our life. And, and God's people never tire of hearing of it. Uh, that's for, for sure. Uh, by the way, this Christmas, don't miss a service if you can help it. If you have to be gone, live stream it, watch it later. I've been so stirred in studying uh, for these Christmas lessons, uh, Christmas messages, if, excuse me, and uh, studying some of the characters you might not have thought about or never think about really with Christmas. And I'm excited about it as we're going to work our way through Luke 2 and think of people like Simeon and Anna and these characters that you may not think about and their witness of the Christmas time here. It just, it's fascinating. It makes it come alive again. I hope you'll be here every service, if at all possible, but looking at this again tonight and the next, uh, this Sunday and the next two Sundays beyond. Luke 2, verses 1 to 7, and we're going to read there. In fact, like many of you haven't memorized, let's stand together. If you haven't memorized, you can say it with me. If not, you can read it with me, but let's all read it. We don't normally do that, but maybe some of you are going to be itching just to say it because it's on your tongue. You know, you know this so far familiar passage, and we're going to go through verse 7. Ready? Together. Here we go. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Thank you. I want to preach this morning this message entitled, The Innkeeper's Christmas Story. The Innkeeper's Christmas Story. Uh, the last couple of years we've been on this theme at Christmas all, called Christmas Witnesses. We've heard Joseph's witness, his Christmas story, and Mary's witness two years ago, her Christmas story. Several messages on those. We've got probably one or maybe two messages on some of these, of, of these different ones and their story, from their point of view, what the Bible says. I hope and trust God will use it in your life. Let's pray together. Father, help us now as we look at your word. I pray that you'd work among us, move among us. Lord, may there not be one person here that you don't speak to, and may we have our ears open to hear and desiring you to speak to each heart here. Lord, one that's lost here this morning, I pray they'd be saved. Lord, maybe there's many that are lost. I pray they'd come to you this morning, trusting you. Lord, you're offering that free gift yet of salvation that was purchased on that old rugged cross by the blood of your dear son who died for my sins and for the sins of the whole world. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, it doesn't matter who they are, no matter their background, no matter what they've done, you desire to save them if they would look to you and turn to you and repent of their sin and by faith trust you this morning. For us that know you as Savior, help us to be obedient believers and respond to your word as it speaks by your spirit. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated there. Jesus Christ came into a dark world. It was 400 years since they last had any word from the Lord. Uh, Herod, uh, a descendant of Esau, Edom, Edomites, a murderous madman sat on the throne 
Think of that. This was not a Jew sitting on their own. It was of Esau. The word of God had been silent for 400 years. But no matter how dark the day, the Lord always has his devoted, his obedient servants. He has his remnant. And he's always desiring to work through his remnant. And I want to say, God is looking for a remnant today of believers and people that will stand with him and stand with his word even in our day. God is looking for a remnant through whom to work. To work. While Jesus here was as weak as any other baby, humanly speaking, we just read about it, he was just born here in verse 7. He was also the center of power as far as heaven was concerned. You've got to almost imagine the angels peering down and looking at this amazing demonstration and display of God's love that God would robe himself in flesh and become a man and become a baby. I mean, you think about it. I mean, think how humbling it would be this morning for me here, David, stand up here for me. Here, Brother McGowan, he's a, a, a grown man, a, a married man now, and to say, David, we're going to have you go back to be a baby. Don't say anything. <laughs> but uh, that would be embarrassing. I've known some people that had uh, some type of a disease, and I can't think of the name right now, but they had to learn to walk again, learn to talk again, had, to, had someone spoon feed them, had to be helped, had to go to the bathroom again, had to relearn everything again. That would be humbling for a man. Can you imagine God, the creator of heaven and earth, coming to this earth to be a man would be enough, but then to become as a baby and be dependent like that and grow and go through uh, baby, infant, childhood, all that. Pretty amazing. Thank you. You Be seated. That's what our God did for us in his great love. And so imagine the angels looking at this great display, this great demonstration of God's love for humanity, for the world. It's not talking about the ball of dirt. Okay, it's talking about the people, the world. God loved us to that degree. And though he was a baby, the universe revolved around him. This is God, though man. God robed in flesh. Think of it. The center of the universe. Verse 4, the Bible says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Why? Because he was of the house and lineage of David. So why did Mary have to go to Bethlehem then? Why didn't she have to go as well? Because if you remember, she was also of the house and lineage of David. She was a descendant of a different son of David, down through the years. And so we've studied that in the past. Think of that. So both of them have to go. Every 14 years, the Romans would do a census. They'd do a taxing. This was not one of the ordinary ones. In that time, just the men would go and back to that and pay the tax. This was a special tax just at this time. Imagine that. Just for right now, for this Caesar Augustus to declare at this moment in history. It's thrilling to read this simple, uh, historically accurate chapter with tremendous spiritual truth behind it. How God was moving uh, a little, really peasants, uh, poor people, from Joseph and Mary from Nazareth, uh, 60 miles by air, but probably 103 miles or so by road, all the way to Bethlehem at this time. It took them several days, no doubt, to get there. For right at the moment when she's going to have... This baby. So Jesus was born in, in, amid a world movement, if you will. People were traveling everywhere. Uh, it was international movement. Uh, as far as Roman uh, Empire stretched, people were moving to their, where, their birthplace uh, and to come there for this taxing. Uh, one word from a pagan emperor in Rome uh, moved everybody through the vast domains of Rome. Caesar Augustus attempted to make himself a god. You, you study the two names out, study what the name of Caesar means, and especially the name of Augustus. We won't take the time. But he was adding these na names to him. He wanted to be a god. He wanted to be worshipped. He, he signed a tax bill. Which, it's caused this all to happen at this time. It's fascinating. Think about it. He wants to be a god, and this woman is carrying in her womb the son of God. It's amazing, really, as only God does amazing 
This Caesar Augustus tried to make himself God, but nobody today reverences him. And nobody uh, today pays taxes to him or worships him. But that little baby in Mary's womb, here's a whole room filled of people that come to worship the Lord Jesus. Uh, many of us here call him our Savior. Uh, think of how God works even through the edicts of man. Don't you see, Caesar Augustus was ruling, but Christ was in control. <laughs> God was in charge. Caesar Augustus was merely a tool in God's hand to accomplish the prophecy of Micah. Remember Micah 5 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old. From everlasting. This is remarkable. Everything that happened was arranged by God. And God was working in all these things. I've got to get my note paper out here. Make sure I follow the notes for these children as we go along. But uh, they're keeping track of it on this innkeeper's Christmas story. And so I'm glad you're working on that. Good. That's very good. And uh, we hadn't had a present for you before to do this. So this is very exciting, isn't it? If anyone had said to Caesar at this time, hey, wait a minute. Don't you realize, Caesar, what you're asking people? They're expectant mothers. I mean, they're going to have babies in the next days. You can't make all these mothers go too. And shouldn't there be some exceptions? You can imagine what his answer would have been. I don't care about mothers. I don't care about babies. I care about taxes. I care about power. I care about my luxury and my lifestyle. I care less about these people. We conquered them. They'll do as we say. But that's all gone now. All this tax money is gone. Caesar's gone. But God and his son live on. <laughs> in verse 2, just so you know, he mentions here when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And again, these things can be seen in history that what happened at this time, and you can study it from a historical sense as well as from what the Bible gives. This is not a history book, but any times it talks about history, it's completely accurate down to the smallest detail. If history thinks it's wrong, they just haven't figured out yet that God was right all along. And they will. They, they used to laugh at the Bible saying the Hittites, the Bible talks about the Hittites, never been in a group of the Hittites. And then they discovered there was a group called the Hittites and found stuff about them. And so we just hadn't found evidence of it yet, but the Bible you could count on is true. Well, Cyrenius, he was a man of humble birth. He was a soldier of fortune. He had won some big battles for Rome and, and the Cilician victories, and, and even his death was marked by a state funeral. And so that's who Cyrenius is that's mentioned there in verse 2. But let's come to this innkeeper now. Think of, of Joseph and Mary, and they're arriving in Bethlehem this holy night. Verses 5, 6, and 7. To be taxed with Mary his espoused wife being great with child. And some of you ladies can say, I know exactly what that means, right? And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Uh, two things this morning. First of all, I want you to see the history of the inn. Here, the innkeeper, if you can imagine, we're thinking of this Christmas witnesses, that, that, that series in here. He's going to come up and take the witness stand, and he's going to tell his story, his Christmas story. I think, first of all, we've got to see the history of this inn. If you could have heard the innkeeper talk about that inn, you would have heard him boast about its history. Its history. I'm sure many a night after they had fed their guests there at the inn, and some people say, well, I wonder which inn they stayed at in Bethlehem. Was it a holiday inn? Was it the... There was only one inn, okay? If you, even Bethlehem today, if you go visit it, it's a small town even to this day. There's one inn there, all right? It was that way throughout the Bible. I'll mention it in just a minute. And so I can imagine after they fed their guests there at the inn, and people were kind of uh, the evening waxing on and about to turn in, he would tell stories. You know, they didn't have TV or anything. No, no, no YouTube, all right, no, no tablet, and nothing, no radio. And so they would tell stories. They like to hear stories. How many like to hear a story? Uh, even now, we, we've been doing bonfires at our house. How many all like to do a bonfire? And just sit out by the bonfire and just listen to the pop of the wood and watch the orange and the coals. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice. It's peaceful. And, and just sit around and talk. And, and people did that same type of thing. And so here they are. And like you can imagine the innkeeper saying, let me tell you about this place. This, you're staying in a famous place. 
You don't understand. This is a special place. Some would even say this is a sacred place. My great, 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 great grandfather, Chimham, was given this place by David. Now, you can study it for yourself, 2 Samuel 19, 38 through 40. Uh, you can hear him talk about, boasting about this place. It's fascinating. Jeremiah 41, 17, you see it again. But Chimham was the son of Barzillai. David, when he was running from Absalom, Barzillai was kind to him, and Barzillai uh, took care of him, and Barzillai cared for him and helped him. And then when they were going back across the river, back to the kingdom, now Absalom's been put down. He says, come with me, Barzillai. I'm going to take care of you. You eat at my table until your dying days. He's already an old man. And he says, I couldn't enjoy it. I'm old. I'm ready to die soon. I want to just stay, stay at the house here. But take my son, Chimham. C-H-I-M-H-A-M. Chimham. You take him and do unto him as you would do to me. And so Chimham goes. And as the, as the not only tradition, but the Bible alludes to, David will give him something very special. And David, at the end of his life, or at some point here, will give him the old homestead. Jesse's house, back in Bethlehem. And many believe even this inn was actually Jesse's house converted into an inn. Now that's interesting. Very, very possibly, even these fields where the shepherds, look, the shepherds tonight, were the same fields where David once watched his sheep when they called him to anoint him king. Very fascinating, very interesting for you to study about it. But I can imagine, don't you like to tell a story? This innkeeper telling, let me tell you how awesome this place really is. How famous this place really is. Hear him. This was built by this loyal servant of, of David. And this was transformed. This was the old homestead or whatever. And I'm telling about my great, I'm related to him. My great, 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 whatever it was. The way they would pass down houses and lands in that day. In fact, it was law for them to do that, keep it in the family. Very likely that was the case. He was a part of David's inner circle. He knew David. He ate with David. Hear him wowing everyone. Can you hear him? And then the next night, maybe, say, oh, by the way, let me tell you this. We've had some famous people stay here. Right? And that's funny. In restaurants, people have pictures up of some famous that ate there and they'll sign it or something. Or, or maybe hotels. And they said... Maybe you've heard of him. The prophet Jeremiah stayed here. You read it for yourself. Jeremiah 41, 17. Stayed in the place in Bethlehem belonging to Chimham. Very interesting. Jeremiah. Maybe you've heard of him. He would, you know, these are people the Jews would know. The prophet Jeremiah stayed here. Maybe he had the Jeremiah room, you know. You had to pay extra for that one. I don't know. But pretty, pretty awesome. He's, he's boasting about it. The history of this inn. Number two, the heart of the inn. The history of his inn, and then the heart of his inn, the innkeeper's inn. He's telling his story. I can imagine him talking to us this morning. Oh, let me tell you the greatest regret of my life. This was the greatest regret of my life. As I was bragging about my great, 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 great grandfather and how he was friends with David and so on, Right here. I'd come to my inn, Joseph and Mary, and you know who was born? Not in my nicest room, not in the Jeremiah suite, but in my cattle shed, in our cave, likely that was. Uh, he, he, time out just for a minute. In that day, the eastern, in knowing that region, likely it wasn't a cattle shed as you see pictured in the nativity scene, it was likely a cave that they were in. And, and uh, this was not, you know, air-conditioned, not heated, uh, didn't have bathroom facilities in it. This is the type of place that he turned over to them. And so here, here this, this innkeeper is saying, my great regret is while I was wowing my guests with the history, I missed right here in that day the King of Kings of the lineage of David that would one day sit on the throne of David was born. He could have been born right in this end. But I said, no room. No room for you. That's what the Bible says in verse 7. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swathing and clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the end. Oh, I so regret that day. It was true. I was full. 
I mean, everybody was traveling. I was packed. But I had the nicest room in the place. I never once considered giving him my room. Never once considered a sacrifice like that to let them take my room. Hmm. Yeah, I can still, I can still see the peasant looking man pushing through the crowd with that Nazarene accent, dirty from a long trip, like I said, minimum 60 miles, wore out on a dusty road. I can still be pushing through the crowd. Please, sir, I've got to have a room. Uh, literally, my wife is about to give birth and, and, and on a donkey. Help me, please. I would have been funny, except I could see the panic in him like men get when their wives, for the first time, are going to have a baby and it's time. <laughs> I said, look around. We're full. I don't have any rooms. Please, sir, help us. He begged, pled for room. No room. No room. See for yourself, there's not a vacant room here. But feel free. Look at the cave there. Feel free to make do with that the best you can. Please, no, sir. Look how dirty it is. She's going to have a baby, man. I can't take her into that. That's the best I can do. That was a lie. I could have given him my room. I didn't consider some sacrifice like that. It was the greatest regret of my life. So in a rough, a cold cave attached to this ancient inn, the Son of God entered human life. As much God as if he'd ever, never been man, but as much man as if he'd never been God. The God-man. We can't make full sense of it in our mind, but that's what the Bible says. God robed in flesh. So as oxen shook their shaggy heads and camels maybe spitting and looking around with disdain, the floor, as you can imagine, unspeakably foul. It's a cave. Maybe bats were flying in and out as the night Came on. No hot water. Think of this, ladies. No sanitation. No bathroom. No midwife that the Bible records was available. Though just nearby in the inn, there were people paying customers, calling for their meals, maybe singing songs, maybe listening to story and the tales uh, of the innkeeper. They rested in their actual beds that night, and the Christ child was born just that close to them. And they missed it. Can you imagine? Can you imagine looking at your receipt when they found out later? I was at the inn that night. I can't believe we didn't know. I was that close. I had no clue. Interesting, verse 7, the Bible says, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Even in the swaddling clothes, there was a foreshadowing. Let's see, swaddling here is one of Dr. Luke's medical terms, the, the human penman here. It means bandages, like they would wrap a, a body for the burial. Even in the midst of his birth, there was hints of his death. He was born to die, as we sang. I can't help but think right here in the United States of America, what we call ourselves a, a Christian nation, how many people have a Christmas tree and enjoy the Christmas lights and, and enjoy Christmas cookies, hallelujah, and, and uh, Christmas presents, and yet have no clue about the real reason of Christmas. Totally miss the Christ child. Can I ask you? I don't think anyone here is less than one. This is not your first Christmas. But in the Christmas celebrations over the years, have you missed the Lord Jesus Christ in it. We say, oh no, I saw the manger scene, and maybe you saw even our church down there, or maybe you were a part of it, uh, just here in Helena. Well, I'm not talking just about that. In fact, I know from the other side of eternity, if we could hear the innkeeper one last time, he would say, please, let, let me give you just one last word. It wasn't about the room. Yes, I should have given him my room, but 
the be biggest regret is that I should have given him my heart. I had no room for him in my heart. As far as we know, this innkeeper went out in eternity without knowing the Lord. The Bible never tells us any different. I wish I'd given him my heart and I could imagine he would say, Have you, have you, have you, as he go back out, back out into eternity? Have you? What have you done with the Lord Jesus? Friend, this morning, man, woman, boy, girl, have you received the Lord Jesus into your heart? Do you know Christ is your Savior? Have you given your heart to Him? Have you allowed Him to come in? What would your answer be? Has Jesus taken up His abode in you? The Bible says that's His desire. He wants to come in. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that He is desiring to come live inside of us. Paul would say later to the Christians at Corinth, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? He, he lives inside of you. He wants to come and live and take up His dwelling place in you. What's your answer? Oh, please tell me it's not like this innkeeper. No room. No, I've got plans. No, I've got my life to live. No, I've got things. And maybe later, maybe after I finish my things in life, then I'll give Jesus what I have left. I'm telling you, the Lord's coming any time. This may be the last Sunday we have before the Lord's return. Maybe the last Christmas. I don't know that. But I do know this. Jesus desires to save you today. His hand is stretched out still to those that would receive him. The wage of sin is still death. Every one of us are hell deserving here. Every one of us. Oh, don't ever pray, God, give me what I deserve, because what you deserve is hell. That's what I deserve too. But in his mercy and grace, he paid our sin debt, and now he offers for the wage of sin is death. But the gift of God, we're about to open a Christmas gift in a minute. God's extending a gift to you. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This baby that was born would not stay a baby. And he wasn't come just to be born. He came to die for my sin and for yours. If you're not saved here this morning, friend, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's what this is talking about. That's the story we're talking about. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish. That's talking about hell and death but have everlasting life. You could be saved this morning. You say, I'm saved, Pastor. I know Christ is my Savior. I've allowed Him to come into my life. Well, believer, what about, what about that life? You know, you can be saved and have your life so crowded with the things of this world that you have really no room for Jesus in your life. Oh, you say, I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. I'm glad you are. But God didn't say... I just want to save you. He says, I want you to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. He said, he's extended not just an invitation to salvation. That's the miracle of a moment. You get saved in a moment. But he extends also an invitation to discipleship. Follow me. In fact, Jesus, would, who puts no stipulation on salvation, come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come, anyone to me, puts stipulations on discipleship. He says, lest you're willing for this, this, and this. You cannot be my disciple. You cannot. And many of us, because of things of this world, the cares of this world, we've crowded out Christ in our life. Oh, thank God he'll never leave us, forsake us. If you know him as your Savior this morning, that will never change. Praise the Lord. He gives you everlasting life. The everlasting one comes in to take up his abode, and he promises, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Thank God for that. But you and I know we've lived too many days Instead of Christ crowding out the weights and the sins and the lesser things of life, we've allowed those things to crowd Christ out of our life. And if we were honest this week, we've lived no room for Jesus. And I just want to challenge you this morning. Just a simple thought. These young people in here, they can get it. But us adults, we can get it too. The innkeeper would say, oh, if I could do it over. I not only would have given my room, but I would have been out there with the shepherds 
worshiping him. Right in my backyard. He missed it. We have the privilege of living in a nation with churches everywhere, but if we're not careful, you can miss it. Totally miss Jesus in Christmas. Will you bow your head with me?